Hey, good morning, RCC. It is so great to see all of you in the room. If you're joining with us online, I'm going to invite us all to stand this morning, and we're going to sing and declare of God's goodness. Go ahead and worship with us.
right, how you doing, RCC? How you doing this morning? Awesome to be with you. Hey, why don't you welcome all those who are watching us online right now. Will you welcome our brothers and sisters right now all around the world. We love you guys. So glad to have you. I want to ask that you please be a seat, have a seat right now, and encourage you with this, and that is we'd love to hear from you. And there's a Connect card in front of you. Please fill that out. Please fill it out. There, you can also QR code if you're like me. I'm not really into writing anymore. I like to just QR code things, shoot, shoot your uh, cell phone on it, fill it out. Let us know you're here this morning. You can have your prayer need. We'd be honored to pray for you. You guys online like can hit the request prayer button. And our prayer team, our elders, our staff will pray for those Connect cards. Or if you're online, you can join us, and we'd be honored to pray for whatever it is. And later on, if you want to take your Connect card to the crosses, people are already doing that today. You can see people are already starting to put uh, prayer requests in there. You can join them. So there's a, there's a right now a cross on your right and also on your left. Hey, I want to encourage you too. I, I, RCC is just doing amazing things. I, last week was Mother's Day weekend. I hope our moms felt affirmed. And we had over a thousand people here on campus last week. Isn't that amazing? Over a thousand people. I mean, just a couple of years ago, we had 200 people for Mother's Day, and here we are. And so, after a pandemic, it's, uh, RCC's on the move, and, and that's because of your generosity. Your generosity is making a difference, and you can either text to give, you can give online, you guys online can give. Uh, you can actually give right here by filling out the envelope and putting in the giving box on your way out the door. And then the others of us, I want you to notice something. We are, our address has changed to a P.O. box right here, and uh, it's P.O. box 10075 Fleming Island. And you go, well, well, why, why did it change? Well, RCC has done their best to try to make sure your tithes and offerings secure, especially if you mail them. And we got a, a box to make sure that, you know, nobody could get into it. Well, guess what? They did. <laughs> Somebody still opened up and they, and they broke in our, our mailbox. And so uh, we have informed the law, uh, law the law, law enforcement, even that shows up every Sunday. They've, they're already helping us try to identify. Um, so I want to make sure you know that because uh, if, you've, if you've mailed in your tithes and offerings, once you know a couple things, make sure it went to the right place, all right? And then second off, we want to make sure you know it's secure. And that's why we start a P.O. box. So pray for that person or persons, whoever did that. Pray that they meet Jesus. I mean, not after they die, like before, all right? And that they, <laughs> they follow Jesus Christ. And, and uh, so, but want to make sure you know we're doing everything we can to make sure your tithes and offerings are going to growing the kingdom of God. Amen. That's what it's all about. Hey, we want right now, we're going to honor our seniors. It's an amazing, important time. And I hope right now you just allow God to work through you. But give it up right now for our student pastor, Travis, as he comes up. Guys, good morning. So this is one of my favorite uh, mornings uh, of the year, and it's because it's the one where we get to celebrate uh, the graduation of our seniors. So they, uh, I think that getting to this point, graduating high school, has become harder and harder. And watching uh, the work ethic of our students, but also just the character development and everything that it took to get to today is amazing. And we want to celebrate them well. So they're about to come out on stage. And when they do, I don't want golf claps, I want thunder claps, right? I want us to get wild and excited about these kids who have done a great job and they've made it all the way to today and they're about to launch into the next phase of their life. So if you would, stand with me and let's get loud and celebrate the graduating class of 2021. Come on out, guys. Come on, hey, if you're, if you're in the audience, yeah, Nathaniel, come on up, come on up. Come on, give it up, give it up. Keep it going, keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great job. Great job, guys. Okay, have a seat, church. Have a seat. Let's, uh, we're going to, during this time, we're going to speak words of blessing over our students, but we want, we want to recognize first all of the influencers that have poured into these students over the last few years. So first of all, and this is going to be like a, a gradual thing that we're doing, but if, if you are a parent that's in the room that like you, you brought this child of yours home from the hospital and you have like stayed up for the science project and, and you have been the taxi driver for a number of years and you like 
you know, you, you had all the praise in the world, but also all the fear in the world when they got their driver's license and they're, they're finally to today. Parents, come on, stand up. Let us celebrate you and the influence that you've had over these kids today. Great job, mom and dad. Parents, remain standing. Stay standing up. Stay standing up. Um, so we know that you did not do this by yourself, right? So if you are in the room and your family, if your aunts, uncles, grandparents, siblings, or close family friends, we want you to stand up at this time because we know that you've supported these students and also supported mom and dad. So stand up with them, okay? Come on, let's stand. Okay, y'all, y'all stay standing. We also want to recognize that these kids have been led by a great church. They've had Bible class teachers, chaperones, small group leaders, life groups that they've been a part of with their families. Um, and this church has poured into them. And we know that it takes a church to get a kid in faith to today, right? So you are their church. We, would, we want you to stand. We want to recognize everything that it takes to get our students today. Would you stand with us, please? Everybody stand. Yeah. Okay. So now that we're all no, stay standing up. Stay standing up. We're gonna we're gonna stand for the rest of uh, for the for this time. So, all right. So listen, we're gonna speak words of blessing over these students, and then uh, then I'm gonna say a prayer, and then we're gonna sing a song of blessing over them. Their parents are gonna come to the front of the stage. Their students will join them. Uh, down on the front of the stage, but, but the whole song is going to be a song of blessing over them. So I'm going to ask you in just a moment to repeat after me. When you do, would you raise a hand to the kids like you are, are laying hands on them? And when we're singing that song, if you're, if you're willing and able, go ahead and keep that hand out and let them know that you're praying this, this song over them. Okay, so students, we want to say words of blessing over you in their very simple church. Repeat after me. We love you. And we're proud of you. And we believe in you. So go get them. (laughs) Let's pray together. God, we love you and we thank you for moms and dads and siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and the church that that have walked with these students to today. We thank you for their lives, their faith, the way that uh, you showed up in their walk the way that you are near to them right now. And we know that today is a big day and the next couple of months come with a lot of transition, um, a lot of excitement, but also a lot of anxiety uh, for parents and students. So we wanna pray that they can walk boldly into this next phase of life, walk boldly into the story that you are writing with them and for them and know that they are yours. Wherever they go, know that they are yours, know that they are a member of the body of Christ. We pray that they find a great body of Christ to plug into where they go, and they know that they are always welcome with your people in your church. God, as we continue to speak words of blessing and sing words of blessing over them, we pray that their hearts will hear um, us singing these words, and also that they'll receive them as words that you speak over them. These words come from numbers, and it's, it's a blessing that has been prayed over God's people since the time of Moses. It's in these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
것같습니 여러분들 Congratulations, guys. Hey, I'm going to invite us to move back to our seats. We're going to continue 
worshiping together this morning. And part of that worship is celebrating Jesus' sacrifice for us through the remembrance of communion. So we're going to do just that. We're going to continue singing. We're going to take this time to take communion. So if you have your communion a packet ready, now's the time. If not, they are in the breezeways. As you enter, you can grab one right now if you'd like. But we are going to take the bread, which represents Jesus' body broken for us, and the cup, the juice, which represents his blood poured out for us. We're going to take this time to celebrate the new hope, the new life that we have through Jesus. Amen, church. Amen. So take this time, reflect on the Lord, celebrate his goodness and his gift of life through his son. And as you feel ready, we're going to continue to sing and worship. And as you feel led, I want to invite you to stand, engage, and sing with us as you're ready. But let's keep worshiping this morning.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, can we give up again for our seniors again? Can we give up for these seniors, graduate seniors? Praise the Lord. You guys are awesome. Have a seat, please. Have a seat. You know, I tell you what, that was a bad decision to preach on Senior Sunday when you have a graduating senior. I want to tell you right now, that was not a good decision. And, t- and student ministers, they have a way of kind of trashing the place, don't they? I mean, and then uh, they make a mess and they cause, there's lots of tears usually with student ministry. So, uh, uh, you know, I tell you, God is on the move, and we're so thankful for all that God's doing in our senior class. And I had a lady come up to me on Thursday night from our Thursday night service, and she just said, you know, I'm from Maryland. It seems that you hear all this doom and gloom, and I come here, I visit here down in Fleming Island, come to your church, and it seems like God, there's like a revival breaking out. And I just think that's pretty awesome. And that's happening through this church, that, that, that people are finding hope through RCC. And so, so we need to have hope. And, and so one reason why I think God has given us so much hope is because we're a Bible-based church. We base everything on the Word of God. Amen? And so we are going into the It Is Written series, and that's what I'm doing. I'm preaching out of whatever we're reading this past week in our daily Bible. And you can join us, even if you haven't or you've fallen back, you can still join us. You can get a Bible at the Welcome Center, grab one before you leave today, and just join on, just join today. And, and, then, and then pick up and, and, and walk with us the rest of the year. And then on top of that, if you've kind of you know, slacked off a little bit. It's okay. Get, just jump back with us and, and trail with us here. And let's be on this journey together. Today we find ourselves in, in the life of Solomon. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up, open up to 1 Kings chapter 3. And as you're open up there, I want to ask you a question that I want you to wrestle with. And here it is. How does one seemingly be on top of the world, all right, fall to such a depth that they can't remember being on top of anything. Like, how does somebody go from top to bottom? How does someone go, as we say in the South, from the penthouse to the outhouse, right? I mean, because spiritually, we ought to be moving like from immaturity to maturity, right? We should be going from self-centeredness to Christ-likeness. Like, that should be the trend. So how does one go from incredible wisdom to incredible foolishness? I was moved by this pastor who's also a police officer, and I want to read to you what he wrote. He said, a few years ago, I stood at the front of our church, and it was a sacred moment where a man and woman stood with me, and they were dressed in the best clothes that they'll ever wear on their, in their life. And they held each other's hands and looked at each other's eyes, and they said the words before God and all of us, all of us witnesses, I pledge my love to you. I promise I'm going to love you. I will cherish you. And as long as, my, as God allows my heart to beat, it will beat for you. Then he says, later on that night, 10 o'clock, I changed out my pastor clothes and put on my police uniform. And I went out about 10 that night, and I went to a domestic dispute. And we got there, there was, already, there was already several police cars there, and when I walked in, the police officers were restraining a husband and a wife, and they were yelling and screaming at uh, obscenity, obscenities at one another, restraining, being restrained by these police officers. They already had enough cops. They didn't need more in that room. So I walked out and kind of surveyed the area, surveyed the house. And I noticed there were plants that, were, that had been thrown at one another because there was dirt all over the place. And as I was standing there, all of a sudden, in the corner, a little girl about three years of age and a little boy about 18 months old came out of hiding from behind the sofa. And the little guy came up and went to the pastor, the, the slash police officer, with his hands up, and the three-year-old girl said this, Mr., can you hold my brother? He's scared. And this pastor, police officer, picked him up, and he tucked his head by the boy's head because he was trying to hide himself because he was bawling like a baby. And he asked these questions. He says, how does this happen? How does one go from a vibrant exclamation of love at the beginning of marriage to a nightmare drag out hell on earth? How does this happen? Well, today we're going to trace a downward spiral uh, and as we look at the life of Solomon, and hopefully this doesn't happen in any area of our life. And so we're going to look at Solomon's life right now. And so in 1 Kings chapter 3, it says right here, Solomon's on top of the world. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, he said this, look at this. He said, ask for, read with me, church, whatever you want. Whatever you want me to give you. Can you imagine if God asked you that question? Hey, hey, Bob, hey, hey, Susie, (laughs) whatever you want. Now, let's pause here. Wouldn't that be nice? And my paraphrase to how Solomon answers this question is this. I'm in over my head. 
Like this whole king thing has got me overwhelmed. So here's what he says. So give your servant a discerning heart. I need a discerning heart, God, to govern your people, distinguish between right and wrong. And that phrase right there, discerning heart, means I need to be in tune with you, God. I need to be in tune with your heart. I need wisdom, like a lot, a lot of wisdom. And so the scan down, I think here's what, this is what's amazing. The Lord was, look at this, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. In fact, God was so pleased with it that not only did he shower him with wisdom, he showered him with riches and expansion and fame. And God gave him more than he ever asked. And, it, and it, he was so pleased with Solomon. Do you ever do that with your kids? You ever say to your kids, hey, you can do anything you want. You can do anything you want, and they make such a stunningly good choice, and you say, man, I'm so proud of you. Not only am I going to give you this, I'm going to give you that. Have you ever done that? Me neither. I've never done that. <laughs> I just want to see if any of you guys did, all right? I'm, I ain't doing that. I want you to know that not only was Solomon, God was happy with Solomon, but all Israel was happy with Solomon. Immediately we see the wisdom of God on display through Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. Here's what's going on. You've got two prostitutes and they live in the same house. Well, lo and behold, they both get pregnant at the same time. And, and one of them gives uh, birth to a baby boy. The other one gives birth to a baby boy. They're born three days apart. Well, in the middle of the night, they both, women sleep with their sons, their baby sons, and one of them rolls over and accidentally suffocates her child, kills her child on accident. She wakes up and realizes that her son's dead, so, so, so guess what she does? She goes and takes the dead baby and switches it out with the other woman's baby and sneaks her dead child with that one, takes the live, the live baby boy, and then all of a sudden the, the woman whose baby's been switched out, the other woman, she wakes up to nurse her child and notices that her child is dead. Well, upon further exp- examination, she realizes this is not her son. The other woman has her son. Well, this goes through the legal process. It goes all the way up to King Solomon. King Solomon is presented with this incredibly hard decision. And so he says these words, bring me the baby. They bring the baby. He says, put the baby on the table. They put the baby on the table. He says, bring me a sword. Bring you a sword? Yeah, bring me a sword. And he says, I will cut the baby in half. Mom one, you get half. Mom two, you get half. And as he raises the sword in the air to cut the child in half, all of a sudden the real mom says, wait, don't cut the child. She can have the baby. And then Solomon says, give the baby to that woman because she is the mother of the child. And look what it says. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in what? They held the king in awe. Because they saw they had wisdom from God to administer justice. Solomon's reputation is growing. It's like growing like a, it's like a tsunami that's going to take over the world like one big wave. And if you're taking notes, you can just write this in your notes. Solomon is so wise that he wrote 3,000 proverbs. 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. I mean, his dad's known as a songwriter. He blew his dad out of the water, wrote wrote even more songs than his daddy did. And everything in Solomon's life is poised to go up and to the right, well, until this happened. Look what happened right here in 1 Kings chapter 11. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of, of David his father had been. He followed Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David, his father, had done. It's like, how in the world do you go from extreme wisdom to extreme foolishness? Well, let me clarify how far Solomon has sunk. He is worshiping the goddess Ashtoreth. Ashtoreth is a Canaanite fertility god, and if you worshiped this goddess, it involved cultic sexual morality. That's shocking. What's even more shocking is that he worshiped the detestable, the detestable god Molech. Molech is of the Ammonites. If you dig further into it, if you worship Molech, it meant you offered human sacrifices. Well, often people would give up their own children 
to be burned up in the altar to appease this fake God. And somehow, the king of God's holy people, Solomon, is involved in this. Now, don't miss the irony. Solomon, who began his career with restoring a baby with his mother, is now ending his career to worshiping a God that included child sacrifices by their own parents. Again, how in the world do you fall so far down? I mean, nobody, including Solomon, intended on falling like from greatness. I mean, think about it. Uh, couples who make vows on wedding days. It's beautiful. I was with a, a couple yesterday officiating a, a, a wedding. It was a beautiful service. And, and no couple officia- I mean, making vows to one another, they, they don't dream of ending up in domestic violence and, and with hate-filled speech. But there are decisions made all along the way, right, that left unchecked, they will have this potential to take even the best of people like Solomon and lead them down to disgusting depths. Now, let's look at this formula right now. And I call this sermon, because I'm such an encourager, how to ruin your life in four easy steps. Now, some of you right now are thinking, I don't need this sermon, because I wrote this sermon. Like, I, I wrote the formula on this. So I'm hoping that we learn from our mistakes today, especially you graduates, learn from our mistakes, and don't go down this rabbit hole that Solomon chose to go down. The first step in ruining your life is this, leave a little wiggle room in your commitment. That's the first step. First, cha- uh, first Kings 3, it says this, Solomon showed his, his love for the Lord by walking according to the stru- instructions given him by his father, David. Read this next word with me, except except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. What's the big word in this sentence? What's that word again? Except, except. Now, now once you hit the word except, it doesn't matter what happens next, right? You know he's in trouble. Case in point, guys, try this on your wife. Honey, I love you, and I promise to be faithful to you. Except, like, whatever you say next, you're dead, I mean, that principle is at stake here. Here it is. Here's the principle. There's no such thing as partial commitment. There's no accept clauses in devotion. Let's take another look at this whole accepting. Accept that he offers sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. These high places were always devoted to these other gods. And God is constantly saying, get rid of them. Well, the Israelites were thinking, let's keep them around because we can use these high places to worship the one true God. Well, they may have had good intentions, but they were not fully obedient. Listen, good intentions are never a substitute for obedience. Or someone put it this way, direction, not intentions, determines destination. Direction, not intentions, determines destination. They were still not separating themselves from pagan influence and idolatry the way that God had commanded them to. And this led to, this wiggle room, led to Solomon's downfall. He started making few exceptions, started worshiping God on his own terms instead of worshiping, worshiping God the way that God commanded him to worship. And the most dangerous step on the downward spiral is you get almost right, you get almost right, and you think that's enough. It's not okay because inevitably it opens up the door for more wiggle room. Just look at what happens a couple verses earlier. Solomon made an alliance with, with, with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Now think about this. What, what's the king of Israel doing marrying somebody from Egypt? I mean, the Bible's very clear. Don't intermarry with these other places. What's going on is part of the sealing of these trade and military alliances. They would intermarry, intermarry between these countries, between families of power. So each party had invested interest because they didn't want to later on kill each other's grandchildren. Because of, of this little wiggle room here, I mean, no big deal, right? Just a few exceptions. But he left the door open and the wind came and it blew it wide open. Look what happened. Verse 4, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Remember the principle, there's no such thing as partial commitment. Another way of saying it, when you begin with an exception clause, you will never arrive at full devotion. When you begin with an exception clause, you will never arrive at full devotion. 
95% devotion to God is still 5% short. And some of you are going, 95% is pretty high. I mean, that's a strong A, right? 95%. The reason 5% short is if you leave a little wiggle room at all to your devotion to God, you're opening yourself up to disaster because there's no such thing as partial commitment. Let me explain it this way, maybe in more earthly, practical terms you can understand. I talked to a guy a couple weeks ago. He had an endoscopy. You know, endoscopy, that is where the light goes one way. And a colonoscopy, just reverse that, right? He had an endoscopy and a colonoscopy the same day at the same place. Now, does that bother any of you like it bothers me? (laughs) Could you imagine... If the person who's running this place, you know, who ran the place says, hey, don't worry about it because our equipment is 95% sterilized. I'd be like, I don't think so. Call me when it's 100% sterilized. See, God told the Israelites that he wanted to create a pure spiritual environment for the growth and health of his people. But Solomon allowed some spiritual germs to get involved in his spiritual life, which led to ruining his whole life. Now, let me just say that. You want to mess up your spiritual life, man, leave a little wiggle room. The second thing you want to do to ruin your life is this. Assume that you're the exception to the rule. The truth is, when you think you're the exception, I mean, you're all for God's commands, but except you think the commands apply to everybody else, right? You think you're more sophisticated, you're a little bit above everybody, everybody else. You see, the problem with anything less than total obedience is you're the one that gets to choose which ones of God's commands I'm going to submit to and which ones I'm not going to submit to. You begin to become your own king, you begin to become your own God. And if you want to notice this, I want to challenge you to look at two verses. We're going to look at back and forth between two verses. First Kings chapter 10, and another one's Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let's we'll start with Deuteronomy 17. Moses, hundreds of years earlier, knows that Israel's going to have a king. And here's what he says about the king. He says, the king of Israel, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. Now, that's a pretty clear command, wouldn't you say? Don't get horses, a huge amount of horses. What? What's the big deal with that? Don't rely on military power, he's saying. Rely on me to protect you. That's what God wants. All right? And, and, and don't go to Egypt to get them. I mean, Deuteronomy is basically saying, hey, we just got out of slavery, being mistreated for 400 years. Don't go back to Egypt. Well, guess what Solomon does? Look what it says in 1 Kings 10. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses, which he kept in the chariot cities and also with him in Jerusalem. 12,000 horses. I think that's a little overkill. And not only that, guess where he got the horses from? Anybody want to take a guess on that? Look at the next, look at the next verse. Solomon's horses were imported from where? Egypt. God says, stay away from Egypt. And the first thing Solomon does is go hook up with one of Pharaoh's daughters and then brings 12,000 horses from Egypt. And I would bet the farm on this, if you were to ask Solomon, what are you thinking? What What are you drinking? Like, are you crazy? He would say, well, that's generally good counsel that God gave, but I know a lot of kings that would get messed up. They would get messed up if they got too close to Egypt, but not me. Not me. You know, back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it says, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. I think we know how this one goes. And in 1 Kings 11, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. On the count of three, I want you to ask me how many women, all right? On the count of three, I want you, all you, even guys online, ask me how many women. Here we go. One, two, three. I'm glad you asked. 700 wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. Now, I don't know if you guys heard the joke about Solomon and all of his 700 wives. Well, there, there was an arguing, there was arguing going on between the 700 wives. I know that's hard to imagine. <laughs> and Solomon, being a man full of wisdom, he wanted to end the arguing. 
And so we got all 700 wives in one room. Can you imagine that? All 700 wives in one room. And he stands up and he says, to, before all his wives, he says, hey, all of you are going to have an opportunity to express your issues. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin with the oldest. And no one stood up. End of argument right there. That was the end of the argument. <laughs> Wise man, amen? Wise man. You see, Solomon started up by asking God, God, I need your blessing. He started that, but then he forgot all about that God had done for him and that all God had said to him. And guess what he started doing? He started making up his own rules. So let me ask you, here's a question I want to ask you. How's your humility meter? How's your humility meter? Are you, are you saying, you know what? I mean, I hear the rules of God, but I'm the exception. Well, if you're doing that, you're living that, I would say humility meter is pretty low. But if you're going, God, I don't like to hear that. I don't like that command, but I'm going to follow it because you know better than I know. Because you created me. I would say your humility meter is pretty high. Let's go to the next step in, in ruining your life. Here it is. The next step you want to ruin your life. Failure to deal with your predisposed weaknesses. 11.1 one says this, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. He loved Moabites and the Ammonites women, and he loved the Edomite women. He loved the Sidonians, Hittites, Parasites, Cellulites. He loves all types of women, all right? And they, they, they were from nations that God told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after other gods. Look at this word. Say it with me. Oh, it's coming up in a second. I'm sorry. Here it is. One, two, three. Say that word with me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. I want you to notice that word right there, nevertheless. That means there's no wiggle room. This is beyond wiggle room, and this is a direct command. I'm going to do what I want to do, nevertheless, what God says. Do you know anyone that sin has such a hold of them that they know it's wrong, and yet they're saying, nevertheless, I'm going to do it? Sure enough, what God predicted came true. Verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as, his, as the heart of David his father had been. Let me pause here and I want to ask, what is the influences that take place in our lives that lead someone to the nevertheless stage? I would say this, your family, think about your parents. Think about Solomon's parents. Who is Solomon's daddy? David. Who's his mom? Bathsheba. Did anything happen between David and Bathsheba? You ever heard Bathsheba Gate? You ever heard that? Don't you, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that that had to do something to their son? Listen, we often underestimate the deep unconscious imprints that our families of origin leave on our souls. In fact, it's only after we get older, oftentimes, realize the depths of their influence. And David, Solomon's dad, would continue to add more women to his harem till his dying day. And I can't help but think that David's weaknesses impacted his boy, Solomon. Because everyone knew what was going on. And Solomon had ex been exposed to this, this habit his whole life. And I suggest to you that part of Solomon's destructive behavior in the arena of women was influenced by his dad. Now, this is a double-edged sword, so I want to be gentle here. If we're honest... We saw about Solomon's life, we can't ignore this. Parents, do you have any idea the influence you have on your children? I mean, I'm up here with my daughter, and I'm telling you right now, that girl has been watching me since the day she came out of the womb. She knows all my habits. So the question I have to ask myself is, Nathan, are you shaping, building in your habits, in your outlooks, in your strengths and weaknesses that are going to help my daughter, help my sons, Follow God the whole life through. And if you got kids above the age of eight or nine years of age in your home, do you really think they don't know what's going on with you? Do you really think they don't know what you got stashed in your house or, or that habit or that relationship that you got going on that you think nobody knows about? You can't even hide Christmas gifts without them finding it, right? They know what's going on with you. They've been studying you. I mean, kids are like wet cement, and you're putting imprints on them. And when the Spirit of God is your God, here's the question I have to ask. What am I passing on to my kids? Because so much of it is how I do my life. I'm passing that on. 
Of course, there's the other side of it. Are you aware of certain weaknesses in your life? Are you aware of of that? Are you taking steps right now in your life so you don't fall like Solomon fell? Let me ask you this question. What is your signature sin pattern? Are you aware of where your greatest tendency to sin is? Because I want you to know something. It probably hasn't changed in the last several decades. You've been sinning in that way, whatever that way is, probably since you were 12 or 13. And I know you're 55, but Satan's not that, he's not an idiot. He knows exactly where to go after you. He knows your Achilles heel and he's been pounding it and pounding it and pounding it for decades. And many of us just keep falling to it. By God's grace, make yourself accountable To other people, every day be vigilant so that you don't fall in the area that you're most likely to fall. And I plead with you today, face this stuff. Face it. We have Celebrate Recovery. We got amazing ministries right here that talk about your hurts and habits and hang-ups of the power of Jesus. You will be delivered from it. We want you to move forward, not downward. And I'm imploring you to do it quickly because those spirals need to be stopped for you before you pass it on to the people you love most in this world. Find the last step to ruining your life is this one. Here it is. Ignore or silence corrective words. And I would say that this is the surest sign that disaster is coming in your life when you are no longer open to hearing the word of God. In 1 Kings 9, we see the temple of God is finished, the greatest accomplishment of Solomon's life. And then it says this in verse 2, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. Now, in Gibeon is where Solomon asked, God, I need, I need bless, I need wisdom. But now he's going to appear to him a second time with a warning. And here's what it says. He basically says, Solomon, I will, if you will obey me, I will bless you. But then in verse 6, he says this, but if you or your descendants turn away from me, God tells Solomon later on, I will cut them off from the blessing. God knew what was going on in Solomon's heart. And in his grace and in his mercy, he decides to warn Solomon. And I would like to think that if God came to me and said, Nathan, if you don't change, here's a warning. Your kids, your grandkids, they're going to be cut off from the blessing. And I would hope that my heart would say, yes, Lord, I'm following your ways. On behalf of me and my family, I'm doing that. Look what happens, though. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Oftentimes, when you walk through step one, step two, step three, your heart is so cold, your ears are so shut off that you don't hear the word of God anymore. God pronounces judgment on Solomon. He says, I'm sending a messenger. His name is Jeroboam. He's going to rip the kingdom out of your hands. Ten of the tribes are going to go to him because of your sin. And guess what Solomon does? Look what it says. So Solomon tries to kill Jeroboam. That's a huge difference between Solomon and David. When David was confronted with sin by God, remember what he did? He fell on his face. And he said, God, please forgive me. Cleanse me of my sin. But what what does Solomon do? He tries to kill the instrument of judgment. When Solomon gets rebuked, he does the hard-hearted, prideful thing And I'm begging you not to do that. So here's a question I want you to chew on as we close. Do you have a heart, parent, grandparents, young person? Do you have a heart that is open? Open to hearing what you don't want to hear? Is it soft to God, moldable to corrective words? Or do you become so easily offended? Do you become so defensive that you think you're the exception and not the rule? You just start leaving a little wiggle room in your commitment. So here's a couple of questions as we close. I want God to work on you with these questions. I'm going to ask you, please stand. Why don't you stand with me as we think about these questions. Here it is. Is your surrender, church, is your surrender a full surrender or is it a partial commitment? Are you fudging on some rules right now? You know, most shouldn't do this, but I can get away with it. Right now, or you, or you have some stuff in your past that you, you haven't dealt with for years that's reeking right now into your present life? What about that voice of correction? Are you open to hearing words from God that you don't want to hear? 
Where are you at right now in your humility? And I pray right now as you chew on these words that God will move you to a full surrender and not from a partial commitment. Let's go to God in prayer right now. Father God, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you so much for giving us a warning. Lord, thank you for your mercy to say you've got to stop doing that. You need to change. It's not going to just impact you. It's going to impact your friends. It's going to impact generations who are coming behind you. It's going to impact generations that are right now. It's time to turn. It's time to change before it's too late. Lord, I'm asking for you right now to have your way in going through our hearts right now. Lord, go through the spaces that we have, we have cut off from you. We've said, God, I don't want you to go in that room. You can go in these rooms, but God, don't go in that room. I don't want you having your way in that room. So right now, Lord, I pray for some people to open up the door and allow you to step into that room and to start to cleanse out that sin, to start cleanse out those habits and those hurts and those hang-ups that have enslaved us for sometimes for decades. And Lord, help us to take action steps to get help. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for forgiveness that would go in and cleanse any sin, even those hidden sins right now, through the power of Jesus. But Lord, help us to walk in repentance and have a heart that's moldable and soft and open to you right now to say, Lord, have your will be done in my life, even in that area. Lord, thank you so much for hearing our prayer, for answering our prayer through the power of Jesus. And the whole church said, amen. If there's anything we could be blessed to you, I want you right now to write, you know, maybe right now, and you give this sin up. You can take it to the cross. Write on that card, take it to the cross. You guys online, you can hit that request prayer button. Maybe today you need to surrender, just totally surrender. I'm in partial commitment to God now, and he totally surrender. You can do that. Let us know. Maybe today's for the first time you want to do it. Maybe you want to recommit. The first time you want to recommit, give your life to Jesus Christ. You can do that. Let us know by going to the crosses right now. We're going to sing a song about surrender and how we need him to fight this battle. Let's give him all the glory. Amen, church? Let's give him all the praise. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. You see a mountain and As I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you Let's sing this out So in I fight Fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. And I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for can be against me for Jesus there's nothing impossible for you
you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. In Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Yeah. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. God. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you want to know more about welcome uh, RCC, you need to go to welcome RCC. If you've been coming for like longer than a month and you want to get into the life and get to the mission of RCC, you need to be there next week. Pastor Anthony leads an amazing welcome RCC once a month, each and every month, and it's going to happen next Sunday during second service. So we hope you'll be there. So go ahead, set it in your calendars, set it in your phones, and make sure you're there. If you have never been a part of Welcome RCC, don't miss this opportunity, all right? Hey, I want to encourage you with this. Uh, one of the best events throughout the whole year on the face of the planet is a father-daughter dance. I tell you what, I'm excited. There's nothing more fun than watching middle-aged men dance with little girls, all right? They're and even these grandfathers, it's hilarious, all right? And the girls love it. And you can be a part of that. Maybe you know somebody else who would love to be a part of it. Just make sure you look in your, your bulletin for details and be here in June. I tell you what, it's, going to, it's coming. So go ahead and register right now. And I want you to know something. Um, uh, two, uh, two years ago, we did uh, bottles for First Coast Women's Services, all right? And we had 150 bottles. And RCC did 150 bottles. It was amazing. It really was. So this year, we thought, you know what? We're going to do 250 bottles. 250 bottles. And guess what? We ran out of bottles before second service was done. Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. So... You go, what's the big deal with these bottles? These bottles, every coin that you put in the bottle, guess what it does? It saves a baby's life from being aborted. Not only that, a mom is open to hearing the word of God in that moment. And a lot of times moms and dads give their life to Jesus Christ. So not only do we save them physically, First Coast Women's Services saves them spiritually. And so here's what we're going to do. That's great. Amen. Amen. So we got additional bottles, all right? We got additional bottles. So let's see, RCC, if you can return back 450 bottles full of coins, cash, and checks to save babies and win people to Jesus. You think we can do that, 450 bottles? I think we can do it. So make sure you grab those bottles that are out there. We got tons of them because we're going to see what you can do. And I'm telling you what, RCC always steps up. Amen. Always steps up. God's always working through this church. Hey, RCC, God's with you. God goes before you. Go change the world. You're doing just that. I love you. And go be a blessing. We'll see you very soon. God bless.